You are listening to From Embers, a weekly show on CFRC 101.9 FM about anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas and practice. We are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples on land that has come to be called Kingston, Ontario, Canada because of the thievery and brutality of the Canadian state and its empire-loving parents. From Embers is about fires, some real and some metaphorical. Fires started generations ago and tended to over the years. Little sparks all across this territory that we hope will grow, spread, and engulf the thieving state called Canada and the capitalist system that has plagued this land since the fur trade. On this episode of From Embers, we're taking a look at a space called the Terrain Vague, which loosely translates into English as the Wasteland. The Terrain Vague is a fairly large, de-industrialized and partially wooded area on the outskirts of Oshelaga, a neighborhood in Montreal's East End and, importantly, very close to the Port of Montreal. I've been hearing about the Terrain Vague as a special fringe space for some years now, although I haven't personally been out there as of yet. And as you'll hear on the show, the space is under threat from several major development projects, both private and public. As a result, those that care about the Terrain Vague have been getting increasingly organized in the past year to develop an analysis of those developments in the context of a broader colonial capitalist strategy at play by the Quebec government, to make links with neighborhood groups like Mobilization 6600, and to take direct action to physically defend the space. I spoke with a Francophone anarchist from Montreal who's active in the defense of the terrain vague. For our listeners who don't understand French, I've included a few translated terms in the show notes. We spoke about the history and context of the terrain vague in Oshelaga, the Quebec government vision for the St. Lawrence River, logistical hubs as points of anarchist intervention, questions around settler-led land defense and how it relates to indigenous-led land defense, and how this project might connect to a renewed push to shut down Canada. I'm an anarchist. I've been living in Montreal for around 10 years and organizing in Montreal for like seven years or something like that. I've, I'm, I live in Oshlag, and which is a neighborhood in Montreal where uh, there's a high concentration of anarchists and radicals of all sorts. And um, in Oshlag, um, there is this very special place that we call the Terrain Vague, which means wasteland, that is in like an industrial zone that is abandoned. It used to be many things. At some point, it used to be part of it used to be a grocery store storage place. Uh, it's also the CN tracks run through it. Um, it's it's very big. It's like maybe two kilometers long or something like that. All the neighborhood uses it for all sorts of things. Like people have fires there. People walk their dogs. People have queer raves. People hold rituals. Like during COVID, it was the only place where people could gather like outside and it became like really, really like people started just the the whole neighborhood started using it so much during COVID, but it's been, it's been a special place for, for people for, for, for a really long time. It's been like abandoned for 20 years or something like that. Some, some part of it. Oh yeah. And and people have been living there also. Uh, Yeah, I, I was, I was sort of like looking up this term terrain vague. I know there's some kind of like urban planning book that was written in English about it. And they were saying some stuff about how it doesn't translate that well into English. Like wasteland doesn't quite capture what terrain vague means in, in French. Um, So I guess maybe Mm. that's why everyone still calls it the terrain vague, even in English. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring up 
COVID because uh, I, I guess a lot of our listeners wouldn't be in Quebec. And I know Quebec had some particularly uh, restrictive conditions during COVID and in particular like a curfew. Um, so can you speak a bit about how people were using it during COVID? Yeah, during curfew, I think during curfew, it was really hard. I think people were still using it, but like there was a curfew at uh, from uh, at times 8 p.m. and at other times 9 p.m. until 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, I was, so I wasn't in Montreal for a lot of the curfew. I like escaped, <laughs> but um, I think it's more it's more the, the restriction on, on getting together. At, at times we couldn't get together in parks, even at distance. Like you couldn't be more than two people in a park or something like that. I don't think it was really that enforced, but cops could could decide to enforce it whenever they wanted. Um, so that was the like, because sometimes cops go into the vague, but, but a lot of, of the time they don't, and you can just hide in the little forest. And I think that's mostly how it was used. I was wondering if you could also just provide some context on the neighborhood of Oshleg and some of the like anti-gentrification struggles and other uh, struggles that have been playing out in the neighborhood that sort of relate to the terrain bag. So Oshlaga is a predominantly white working class neighborhood on the southeastern part of, of the island. It's really close to the port the industrial port it's like on the on the outskirt of it and that that is that is an important information that's going to play out in when i talk about the the struggle uh, to defend terrain vague and it's been under gentrification like really high attacks of gentrif- gentrification for the past 7 or 8 years probably probably people will say 10 years but like it's how long i've been living in a schlag and i've witnessed it like really peak really really hard in the past five years i would say but people have been struggling against gentrification since probably 2013 or 14. there was a there was a time where there were a lot of actions kind of like rolling actions of like broken windows uh paint sprayed on on when on storefronts uh it did end up shutting down some stores. Uh, it got talked about a lot in the media. Um, there were demos. There were demos attacking cops a little bit. There were like more like family family demos with uh, with community organizing. Um, and I'm I'm talking. I'm using past tense not because it's over, but it feels like people are are exhausted, or I I hear less and less of anti-gentrification actions. And it's very depressing to walk around the neighborhood and see how it's changed. It's starting to look more and more like the like the hip neighborhoods of Montreal, like the Myland. And uh, rent has increased like crazy, like almost doubled, like in some parts. Yeah, so I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm maybe I'm a little like, I feel a little defeated. <laughs> But but people have resisted resisted a lot. And do you see that um, struggle as connected or continuous with what's happening now in the terrain bag? Um, that's an interesting question because what's happening in the terrain bag is not is going to is not going to make the neighborhood nicer. So I'm not sure it's a gentrification issue. It's going to ruin the quality of life of the of the people who live, who live on the outskirts of the Thai Vague. Like the like noise and, and quality of air and, um, and like vibration of the ground, all of that is going to be quite bad for, for the, the people who live close by. It's just going in the direction of this is a like, like shitty industrial neighborhood that we can just make more shitty and more industrial kind of vibe and not caring for the well-being of the people who live there. So it's kind of like sacrificing the, the like very end of the neighborhood, and when the like the like nice part that is very gentrified is like quite far from it and won't like suffer from it that much. I guess now would be a good time to to ask you like what exactly is planned for that space by the government and and by industry, and uh, and how does it relate to the broader um, infrastructural development? Um, plan that the provincial government has? 
for the St. Lawrence River? Yeah, so a lot of things are at play on that piece of land. It's owned by like four different bodies. A part of it is owned by the Ministry of Transport. A part of it is owned by Hydro-Québec. Part of it is owned by the CN. And finally, a part of it got bought that used to be to belong to the CN, I believe, by the logistical company Raymond Logistique, uh, which is a logistic and transport of goods company that specializes in, in big containers, you know, the containers that the boats carry and train. There's many projects uh, threatening the terrain vague. Some of them we know little about. Some of them are like unclear, unclear when they're, they're going to happen. They're supposed to build a Hydro-Quebec station on part of it. There's the project of a highway that will like connect a boulevard with the port. Because right, the terrain vague is like, there's like the terrain vague, a big road, and then the port. And there's a plan of like a big road crossing the, the whole terrain vague to just make the um, traffic more fluid between the highway and the port for trucks. But the big the big thing, and the big thing that people have been struggling against is um, what Raymond Logistique is doing, which is they're building a, an intermodal transshipment platform where trains arrive, like put their containers there, and then trucks from, from the, this platform, there's a new road, there's this other also new road being built between the Tahrivai and the port, uh, but to transport all day, all night, every day of the week, more than like a hundred or around like a hundred trucks um, every day moving uh, like 10,000 containers or something like that between the port and the platform. So yeah, we we understand um, what what Raymond Logistique is doing and how much like support it's getting from the government as part of what the government calls Avantage Saint-Laurent, which used to be called uh, Stratégie Maritime du Québec. It got set up like five years ago or something like that. Um, and the CAC, the Quebec government, uh, through that plan, wants to massively invest in the logistic and freight transport sector. And it like is is stating that um, the St. Lawrence River has an underexploited potential and wants to develop its economic potential. And like it wants to make transport infrastructures more efficient and also, uh, most importantly, create um, new industrial port zones or like increase the capacity of the ones that already exist like tremendously. Basically, like being very consistent, consistent in like seeing the St. Lawrence not as a river, but as a seaway and as a like tool for economy and transport, furthering really intensely the, the like colonial history of that river, which is destroying it to transport uh, goods. Yeah, I mean, I was I was reading a bit about Raymont Logistics and what else they do and ended up going down a rabbit hole into logistics and commodity uh, transport. And it's such a strange world. Like, you know, like their whole business at West is, is these plastic pellet packaging factories. It's just so, it's just so weird when you dig into this stuff. And, and I think there has been um, more interest among uh, radicals, anarchists and communists uh, in, in the question of logistics and, and, as a point of intervention, of anti-capitalist intervention. Do you think that's partly what has drawn people into this struggle in Montreal? Everyone wants to like, bloquer les flux and all of that. Um, but it's not, like this specific struggle is really grounded in people's everyday life. And the first impulse that I, that I read for, for most people is to defend that place that they love. It, is, it makes so much sense because it's embedded in this governmental strategy uh, and like capitalist strategy that is like a, a very potent example of everything that we want to fight against. It really comes from just like this place that the, this like little wood that you go to every day to like sit and relax and have fires with your friend and that threatening not to exist anymore.
You're listening to From Embers, a weekly show of anarchist and anti-authoritarian politics, airing every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston, and podcasting online in your favorite podcast app. You can find all our back shows on fremembers.libsyn.com. On this episode, we are speaking with a Francophone anarchist from Montreal who is participating in the defense of the Terrain Vague, a large deindustrialized and wooded area on the outskirts of Oshelaga, which is a neighborhood in Montreal's East End, and is currently under threat by a major logistical series of developments uh, spearheaded by the Quebec government. Um, could you talk a bit about the uh, what has happened so far in terms of the struggle to defend the terrain bag and who the different um, protagonists of that struggle are and, and, and the relationship to the neighborhood? So Raymond Logistique bought um, part of the terrain vague in 2015, I think. The first big destruction of it happened in 2016. And at that at that time, everyone just got really, really surprised. It happened really quickly. Uh, and what used to be a forest and um, little bushes and weird pools in concrete where there were fish and where people were swimming, all of that, like some morning we wake up, we go take a walk and it's not there anymore. And people started looking into what was going on. And at the times, like among radicals, there were like some efforts of organizing some events, but people I think felt really overwhelmed and didn't really know what to do and how to tackle that. And it was a lot of grief also, because it just happened so suddenly and people felt like powerless. Well, I know I did. And there was kind of a, in my in, in the circles that I know, uh, not that much that was was happening. At the same time, though, like citizen, a citizen group formed called Mobilisation 6600. And they started being uh, very active in, in a more like, uh, like public and like citizen way of, of acting. They're called Mobilisation 6600 because 6600 is the number of signatures they wanted to get on this petition to stop uh, the, the Raymond Logistic project. That's 6,600, right? Yeah. I didn't know them at the time. And I think most uh, anarchists didn't even know they existed. Uh, but I think they've been doing like a lot of work since then and quite, a, quite, quite important work in the big, in the big picture. And we'll say, we'll say a year and a half. And then there, it was at night. We were having a fire in the little woods on the northern side of the Tahai Bag and there's bulldozer coming. And we're like, whoa, what is happening? We and that was like on the Ministry of Transport part of the Tahai Bag, and so everyone freaked out. And we were like, "Okay, this can't happen again on this other part of the Tahai Bag." And people got really, really like organized really quickly, uh, ready to defend that part of the Tahai Bag. Then we discovered this plan of the Ministry of Transport to build that part, that like a section of highway that I was talking about earlier. This was kind of a wake-up call, and people started looking at Raymond Logistic more. And also, Raymond Logistic, in, throughout the last year, started working more and more on the piece of the Terrain Vague they claimed they owned. And I think, I, I get confused because it's very, it's very shady and complicated, but um, there was a lot of citizen opposition like in the neighborhood to Raymond Logistic. Like, no one is for that project. Literally no one. The city of Montreal sued Raymond Logistique to try to stop that project from happening. And then they lost. And so Raymond Logistique resumed their work. In the past year, it's like struggle has become like really intensified. And Raymond Logistique has started working more and more. And anarchists met Mobilisation 6600 and there started to be some collaboration, like a lot of like information, like spreading information, like postering, graph, small publications, like a plant and plant and birds identification zine, for example. There's been uh, some like small blockades, like small, like occasional blockades. I mean, small, sometimes it was like 50 people, 
sometimes it was like more 20 people i'm small in the terms that it wasn't intended to to like remain there for a long time it was just like to disrupt what the work that was happening on the work site for for a few hours or for the day and it succeeded many times and also to like draw attention to what was going on there i've heard of like small like disruption of the work site such as messing with surveying gear like removing the poles which i've heard has happened and then like really like fucks up with their day even their week probably at the end of the summer there were um arson attempts of the equipment of Raymond Logistics. And Raymond Logistics came out in the media saying he feared for his employees and and blah, blah, blah. And that got talked about a lot. There have been many events held at the Tain Vague also, parties, but also like conferences, discussions, barbecues, organizing meetings happening at the Tain Vague in, in order to connect with more people. Uh, demos, mostly like Mobilisation 6600, the citizen organization, has have organized like a few like big family type of demo. Uh, they're working hard on their petition still. Uh, I think I think they're just increasing their numbers, uh, their numbers of signatures. Um, there were like people made gardens at the Terrain Vague. There were event like tree planting events in parts of it, you know, like a really like large range of tactics from the like, from like planting a tree to a arson attempt, you know. I'm curious about that. Like when those uh, more confrontational things happened, arson or blockades, was that uh, condemned by Mobilisation 6600 or... um, have people been able to work together even if they don't use all the same tactics? Nothing was ever condemned by by Mobilisation 6600, which I think is really cool and interesting. No, yeah, for the like the reaction to to the um, the arson attempts was very interesting. The Tehvak stuff has been getting quite a bit of media coverage uh, a lot because Mobilisation 6600 does a a lot of work to reach out to to media and so journalists like reached out to them when that happened and i thought the the spokespeople did a really like clever a really clever intervention and they were kind of like we don't do that obviously it's not the tactics that we use and like really like uh, separating themselves from that but then uh moving the question on the question of violence like people say that's violent, but when I look at what the Raymond Logistique is doing to that land and to the neighborhood, that is violence. And like what has happened is nothing in comparison to that, which I thought was a, a clever, a clever uh, way to put it. No, in in for like the blockades that has have happened, I think they've been very supportive of it. It's like it's been a, a, an interesting encounter. Uh, I mean, and I say they, like, it, it's a very large, there's like a, a, a core group of people who have been organizing a lot, but they, they like, they connect with, with like hundreds of people in the neighborhood. And it's not a, it's not a coherent group, group also. So I can just speak of like my, what I've heard, but it's important to not just frame them as this uh, homogeneous group because they, they aren't. But from 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 what I've heard and seen, um, they like they want stuff like the blockades to happen, and they're like happy to have met the like radicals who like are down to organize such things. Like they won't do it, or they will do it in a milder way, but they're happy it's happening. I think some people, uh, like some some radicals, at times have tried to organize more closely with them. Um, I was talking with a friend about it and they were like, we reached a point where we realized it wasn't that much of a good idea because because all sorts of issues like security, security practice issues. Um, and it just got tiring for, for people to explain that over and over that like you, 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 it would be a good idea to not bring your phone 
and like people would argue about that or something like that. And because and because in organizing those things with them, like the my friend who I was talking to was saying that they realized that they they like toned down their desires. And at some point they realized it that shouldn't happen. If there was a period where people tried to organize like like higher intensity actions with mobilization stimulus because it seemed like there was an opening that like stopped happening but but kind of like mobilization stimulus is doing their thing and the radicals are doing their thing and like people are in good terms and like mobilization stimulus does this like important work i think in such struggle to like make it public make it visible and um to draw attention to it in a and to, to like draw more and more people to it and speak to the media and stuff like that. And then the radicals are doing their like more intense tactics and that seemed to go well together. I'm curious what people kind of want uh, to see happen. Um, I know some of the narratives from the neighborhood have been about um, uh, developing a park instead of uh, the Raymond Logistics um, development and then some of the slogans from the radicals have been something along the lines of the terrain vague stays vague or vacant yeah what do you what do you hope to see happen there and and how is that being framed Mm -hmm. it's a good following question to what i was saying because that's one of the if 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 it's been interesting to see how anarchists and radicals and mobilization simulation can work in parallel and kind of get together and like be complementary. That question is where it breaks. Because yeah, mobilization simulation wants wants this place to be turned into a park, uh, like a parc nature in French. I don't know, like a nature park for the forest to be preserved and like maybe having like bike paths and, and things like that. And we are much more interested in how how like the terrain vague as it is escapes the controlled grid of the city, and it's this weird liminal space where all sorts of things can happen, where people can live, where it can be like a cruising spot, it can be a place where queer dance parties happen, it can be a place where like rituals are held and it's not cleaned and and it's not controlled and it's maybe not safe. And we're like, the the like perspective of it becoming a park, like becoming an under controlled zone of the city is extremely sad to me. And so that's what means, that's what like the terrain vague, restera vague means. Cause such spaces are so, so, so rare in the city. Yeah, spaces that evade control. I mean, it, it's funny to hear you talk about it because I I feel like on a smaller, much smaller scale, there's there's a development in Kingston that had the almost the same dynamics where the city wanted to build a road through a park that or through a green space basically that was on the river. Um, the neighborhood was gentrifying around it. Uh, there were a bunch of anarchists who were like keep it sketchy was basically what like, you know, people that like people like that people were like could drink openly in the park and like, you never see cops there or whatever. Um, And there was this sort of like three way thing happening with, and gentrification was a big part of it because the park essentially contributed to the gentrification of it, but it stopped the road. Uh, But yeah, it's just, it's just really familiar to hear you talk about it in that way, because I think, the people I know who uh, care about it, care about it as a wild space, care about it as a space where people can, yeah, there was cruising, there was drinking, there was, you know, just outside of the the eyes of the law. Mm-hmm. That sounds really, really alike. What happened to that place? Uh, half of it is a park um, with a sanctioned graffiti wall. And <laughs> there was the design for it that was called Articulated Wild, which was like basically a landscaped 
swamp uh, things were planted. Uh, so it's fine. I mean, it's it's probably still better than a road. Um, but there's another property just to the north of it that is uh, an old tannery that is still like a wooded area that is really contaminated and uh, people live there. Um, and then there's a condominium development that's proposed for it. And that's become the new kind of focal point for the same dynamics, I would say. But there's less neighborhood involvement because people, a lot of people in the neighborhood don't go there because they think it's sketchy and they don't like it. Um, so the, it plays out differently. It's almost like, you know, a, it's a good strategy to get people to use a space to defend it because like you said you become personally invested you emotionally care about the space and that's so important for people to you know risk themselves to defend something or even just to put their time in but the vision for the space can sometimes become a point of tension mm -hmm. yeah a lot of what has happened in the past year a lot of what we've been trying to do everyone like citizens and anarchists and is like reinforce that attachment to the place and like have all sorts of events happening and to like intensify how we we live and exist there to like to just to, to like yeah so that people like really really want to fight for it um and but like no one created that through the struggle like it's that's what makes that place so special is that the like how much people like live there and 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 care and use that place it's it's been like that for 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 way longer than Raymond Logistic has threatened it but yeah like the outcome one of the things that are very complicated about this struggle is is what we want in the end this outcome because like if you want a, a a park then then there's a plan then it's understandable there's it's maybe like you want the city to get involved to buy it you want uh, the city to do something with it but if we want it to stay wild like it doesn't fit in the logic of how land is organized like there's like the question of demand becomes like tricky because okay if if we want we don't want him logistic to keep on working. We don't want Hydro-Quebec to build their post. We don't want the Ministry of Transport to build their road. We want it to stay just like this, which is like it's owned by all those bodies. Realistically, it's really unclear what can happen. We want all those people to like remain, like to still own those places, but do nothing with them. That's not realistic. Like there's a, the question of like property of land is has to be we have to ask ourselves the question of pro property which is like it really sucks because no one wants to own the land but how can it stay wild like someone has to own it sadly in how the world functions and we reach kind of a dead end there yeah i i feel like that's a good segue to the next thing i wanted to ask which is well people everywhere but also in montreal that there's been a lot of anarchist participation in indigenous led land defense struggles, whether it's solidarity with Wet'suwet'en or uh, Land Back Lane at Six Nations, Tyndanega, also uh, with the moose hunt, uh, with Algonquins up north. I'm wondering how that has informed this struggle and whether, like it's my understanding this is a mainly settler-led, the defense of the terrain vague, um, but like, do you consider it like a land defense struggle? And, and how does it relate to and differ from indigenous led land defense? Yeah, I think I think it's fair to call that a, a land defense struggle. And you're right, it's it's not only settler led, it's probably only settler uh, involved that I know of. The main like most important difference that that has to be said is that like indigenous people have a claim to this land and we don't. And so there's like the whole framework of like why you're defending a piece of land is very different. And like, it's not about property, you know, it's about when I say like indigenous people have a claim to the land, they don't necessarily claim they want to like own it the way the way a company wants to own it, but they want to be like, they want to care for it. 
and they were displaced from their land and they want to have the right to use it. Like all of that is not something that has happened to settlers. We were the one doing it. It's a more complicated position to navigate. But I think it's still important for settlers to like care for the land that we're on because we're on it, you know? And like what what is at play at the Terrain Vague is like part of the bigger like project of intensifying colonial extractive industry. And so to try to stop that is to try to stop a little part of that big machine in the sense that it opposes colonial extractive um, industry. I think it has this like anti-colonial perspective. Like when, so like a, a lot of the people who have been implicated in defending the Terre Vague have been, the same people have been doing, doing solidarity work with the indigenous struggles you were talking about. And I think and it's it's been like really, it's just been nice to like, to talk with like people at Land Back or at the Moose Moratorium about like this thing that we do at home and how like, how how we care for the land where we live also and that like that we're grounded in the place that we live and that we want to like defend the wild there i think it makes sense and and like we've had like cool discussions about that and i think people can connect on that and it's obviously like a very different situation it's really not the same but there's like a connection of caring for the land and for wild spaces uh, that is there and that we can relate on and draw inspiration from. Yeah, it's always tricky to, like, sometimes, like, people equate, like, all, like, make equal all land defense struggles, like, indigenous and non-indigenous land. And I think that's a mistake. And I think it's always really important to talk about how how much the stakes are higher for indigenous people defend their, defending their land in terms of like the impact that it has on their life and the like history of that and also like the repression that is gonna come. And like it is complicated to to defend a land when you're a settler also, but like the history is way less loaded and like the consequences you're gonna face are gonna be way less intense. And like I think settler led land defense can coexist with indigenous um land defense projects, but really shouldn't be put like on the same level or something. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, in the winter of 2020, uh, after the RCMP raids uh, with Soatin in service of this, the coastal gas link pipeline, there was a, a wave of actions, unprecedented probably in Canada, at least since OCA, um, of uh, targeting under the banner shut down Canada, targeting roads, railways, ports, the economic infrastructure of the country, basically, uh, in support of that land defense struggle. Uh, and right now, in the fall of 2021, we're seeing uh, a renewed push at West to defend the river and the drilling under the river. Uh, and already actions have started, including a, um, a brief uh, rail blockade in Montreal last week, I saw. Um, I'm wondering if you think this struggle to defend the terrain vague could play a role uh, if another uh, wave of shutdown Canada actions emerges this year. That would be awesome. <laughs> that that would be an excellent connection to make for sure. Because if if people are able to disrupt this project of like it's like it's 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 just planning to make the poor more efficient, and if people can disrupt with that, it it's like totally in line with the shutdown Canada idea. I mean. I, I, I mean, this is a, maybe a tangent, but do people think of it as Canada or do people think of it as Quebec? Like, would it be shut down Quebec in this case? Or You know what I mean? <laughs> huh. Um, well, well, in the in the winter of 2020, it was like everything that was happening in in um, in Quebec was was under the banner of shut down Canada. Um, even things that like like even if if things that were disrupted were like, there was like some disruption of the port at some time. I don't think it was very efficient, but it was like, it was then under the the government of Quebec, but because it's all part of the same big system, like 
trains travel throughout the country. So if we like, I don't know, like the grain, the, the grain trains that like are supposed to arrive at the terrain vague when it's going to be that transshipment platform, there, there may be from out west, like there could be some research done, but yeah, sure. um, yeah. I think the infrastructures of the government of Quebec like relate to the infrastructures of Canada. Of course. Yeah, yeah. I'm still just trying to wrap my mind around how sort of anti-colonial politics play out in the Quebec context. It's it's really interesting to me. Mm. Um, just maybe like if people want to follow what's going on or learn more about the terrain vague and the context, where would you direct people? So there's a there's a Facebook page, Le Terrain Vague n'est à personne which is another slogan that people came up with in the past years. That means uh, that the Taivag doesn't, like, belongs to no one. Um, but I don't think it's very active. It's like, it has its time. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Mobilisation 6600 is, is quite active on social media. And they relay a lot of information. They would be, like, good to follow. Sometimes, like, news come on come up on um contrepoint media or montreal counter info but there's not like a like anarchists don't have like a steady like platform of information about the terrain vague <laughs> This concludes our episode for today. You've been listening to From Embers, a weekly radio show and podcast covering anarchist ideas and practice. We air every Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time on CFRC 101.9 FM in Kingston. You can find us online at fromembers.bitsin.com or just simply search From Embers in your favorite podcast app. The music you heard tonight was from Total Nada and Blemish, two Montreal-based bands that have played shows in the terrain bag. You can find Total Nada at totalnada.bandcamp.com. You can find Blemish at awd-tapes.bandcamp.com. Send us an email at fromembers at riseup.net. Slaves looking for relief from the steaming hot plate of bullshit served up on the daily by the mainstream media? Are you thirsting for solid and reliable information? 
to escape the mind-numbing vortex of corporate news and Trump tweets? Are you ready to check out every time you hear a Despacito on the radio one more fucking time? Then tune your dial to Sub.media, a mouth-watering hub of infotainment and subversion that'll make you want to quit your job and join the motherfucking resistance. Dive into our newly designed website and gorge yourself on one of the 500 plus videos and audio tracks from our vast library of anarchist films, hip hop and riot porn, or choose from one of our original shows, like Trouble, Burning Cop Car, A's for Anarchy, Video Ninja Reports, and The Stimulator, Netflix. Watch sub.media. Thank you.